what I want to make sure we are, we're all on the same page for here is just the, the basic understanding of how the conservation movement evolved in, um, in the U.S. Uh, this is really important for understanding how we manage coastal resources, how we manage endangered species, how we approach a lot of the regulation and, and, and crafted, and why we crafted certain tools the way we did. Um, and so it's important to have this uh, historical understanding. Uh, the, previous, the previous presentation here uh, set up um, for you guys th this notion of, um, or, or this, this, these examples that humans can indeed directly influence ecosystems and that we can degrade ecosystems and indeed have been doing this for a long time. And so we have lots of evidence that humans have the potential. They don't have to always, every single place, all the time, but, but we at least definitely have the potential and have had the potential for thousands and thousands of years to change ecosystems and to um, have our actions play out for decades and decades, if not centuries later, um, uh, in terms of the ecological dynamics, in terms of the species abundance and the, this and that. And so those previous examples I went through were Easter Island, um, the cedar forests around Mesopotamia, and vegetation in the wake of settlements uh, in the Aleutian Archipelago. So today I want to talk about um, some of the very general philosophical underpinnings of conservation. Is anybody in environmental ethics right now? Nobody? Okay. All right, so we'll go over this real quickly uh, just, just to sort of uh, get, get the broad strokes there. And then we'll talk about, um, uh, we'll go through uh, for a bit of time here uh, through some of the key points in terms of the, the history of cons conservation, the conservation movement, how, how that came to be in the U.S. And then um, end with just a question. So knowing all this, knowing that it's possible for us to degrade ecosystems, knowing that, that, that we've, we've evolved these, these approaches and structures and stuff, um, is that enough? Is just knowing that we might cause a problem enough to avoid, um, to avoid future problems? Okay, so have you guys see, has anybody seen this before? Or something similar to this? Nah, yes, a few people, okay. Um, so this is basically, um, this is after Nash's version, but, but other people have come up with similar things. Um, basically this is the idea of um, how our ethical constructs, how our ethical universe changes over time. Now we could, we could envision this as a baby going to an adult, or we can envision this as the early, uh, a young society, and then over decades or centuries or whatever, moving towards a more quote unquote mature society. Um, it, it, they follow sort of roughly similar paths. So look at the bottom. So we're gonna start at the bottom here. And this is where we start. And so this is, this is everybody has this as their ethical universe at a minimum. As we go up in the diagram, our ethical universe is expanding a little bit. So in other words, things that we think are worthy of consideration, things that, we're, that, that, that are like us or that um, we prize or that we protect or that we value, what have you, um, expand. And so um, we could, if we're talking about our, our cultural, the cultural expression of this starts with us, our, our, our individual selves, and then the next thing that usually gets added to that is our immediate family, mom, dad, sisters, brothers, maybe. Maybe you don't like your brothers. Generally speaking, probably like your brother and sister. Um, and then from there, it goes to the people that are basically near to us, right? That kind of live near us, do the same kind of things as us. So that's our tribe. And then from there, it goes... And, and, and that is pretty much pretty solid, we, at least from the archaeological records, it looks like that's a, that's a pretty, we've been doing that for a long time. So tribes are usually part of our jam, um, it seems like, in human societies and different parts of the planet and different eras. Then at some point, we go from tribe to a regional identity. So the people, not just in my immediate tribe, but the people in our valley or the people in our, our, our chunk of the coast or, or whatever. Um, and then from there, we get to the sort of uh, one of the perhaps more modern idea of, of a nation, right? So, so it, even though it, I might not be regionally close to this person, that person is, 
you know, gets the benefit of my laws and I, I don't steal that person's food and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and and this, is, this is basically the era that we're in right now. Right? So it depends on who you are and where we're talking about. So we might be a little bit higher or lower depending on your assessment, but this is sort of roughly where we are. And then from there it goes to race, people that look like us. Right? And just because they look like us, therefore they get credit and, and I'll, I'll consider them in my ethical circle. And then to all humans, all things that, that, look, that, that are the same species as us. And then from there, it usually goes to animals, is usually the next thing, usually warm fuzzies, usually things with a backbone, and things that have big eyes, and, and, and coo, and, and have fur. Um, and, then, and then, maybe, it goes to things like plants, so something that doesn't have an animated behavior that is a little bit harder for us to identify with. And then from there, on to perhaps all life, this would be something like E.O. Wilson's uh, uh, so-called biophilia, that you know, I, 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 my ethical construct is life. Um, and then to rocks, and then to whole ecosystems, meaning, meaning the rocks plus all the life, and that inherently that system has, has value. And then maybe the whole of the earth, and then maybe the whole of the universe, or whatever. Right now, now um, it, it depends, you know, we have different um, uh, ethical frameworks, different worldviews, uh, religious views and stuff, but but generally speaking, this is fairly robust. Um, no matter where we are, no matter what our system, this, this ger generally tends to fall in, this, in, this, circ in this, this layer of expanding ethics. And so a lot of things that, that we're engaged with in conservation um, you know, requires us valuing the, the, the animals, the plants, the ecosystems, right? And so for some of us, that's not a problem. For others, you know, that, that was, that was a, a problem, particularly in the early days of, of thinking about um, uh, conservation in the environment, right? Is that thing really worthy of my, of my moral concern or no? Um, so that, that's uh, Nash's framework. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the ethical uh, frameworks here. The examples I'm gonna talk about next are all Western, right? So they're all traditional Western Civ stuff you'd see in your Western civilization class in high school or something like that. It's important to say that we have other ways of valuing and other, other uh, uh, conservation uh, philosophies. But for this history talk, these are mostly ignored, right? So these have come on, these have, this stuff always existed, but pretty much was exclu were excluded from the conversations for much of the early times. So I want to mention them. Um, and so this would be something, the different frames, frameworks people use for this, but, but I think a lot of this can fall under what we might call traditional ecological knowledge. And so this would be, um, you know, knowledge of you know, Yurok or Miwa or, or different groups doing burning and burning to manage grasslands and oak woodlands. Uh, doing uh, different practices to manage salmon populations, um, that kind of stuff, um, in addition to, to more philosophical treatises. Um, obviously, we had, we had many different communities that lived in the US uh, before the European settlers came, um, and, and they had a, a diversity of, of views, but most of them were unified by this notion of of the need to manage responsibly, sort of a stewardship type of view um, uh, of, of resources and the natural world. And it, was, and it was something of a responsibility to make sure that what they're doing is the right thing. Um, the colonial system that comes in uh, is, is bent on a bunch, doing a bunch of things, but in the context of, of ethics and these sort of ethical frameworks and traditions, um, it was basically hell-bent on, on slaughtering folks and also hiding their cultures, right? suppressing their cultures. So those, those, those ideas um, weren't even uh, able to be expressed. It wasn't like we, we vetted them, but it was like just, just sort of squish them away. They're not even worthy of our consideration. We almost, almost had some of that interjected in the debate with wildfire in Northern California, came very close to, to pushing back on the initial um, uh, uh, efforts of the federal government to just suppress all burning. 
but it didn't work. It, 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 didn't, it didn't happen there. But so for example, one example was the um, 1850 Act for Government and Protection of Indians, which basically said, hey, the, these folks are all, a, a, you know, a lower caste of, of human beings and, um, and they need to go into an indentured, uh, you know, frameworking system. And so, so that, that prevented these ideas, these philosophies from being able to be, um, you know, properly discussed and, and, and heard in the halls of the rooms where people were, were debating these things. Okay, so as a consequence, these non-Western ethics don't show up in this. So I, I'm, I'm gonna ignore them for now, not because they're unimportant, but just because they, don't, they didn't really play much of a role. Okay, a lot of words here, a lot of words here, so just breathe, we'll just, we'll just read this quote. So the conceptual foundations of our modern conservation ethic really, um, uh, I think for purposes of conservation biology, get going with Darwin. And so this is his um, Descent of Man, so his, his later, later, one of his later writings. And so I'll just read this quote, so you don't you have to write it down or anything. But uh, Darwin says, as man, and it means human, right, but it, that's how he writes back then. As man advances in civilization and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell us would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all the members of the same nation, though personally unknown to him. This point being once reached, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent sympathies extending uh, to all nations and races. And so um, what Darwin is doing here and, and elsewhere in this book is, is arguing that, um, that our ethical constructs are based um, on individuals seeing themselves as part of a community. So an individual as, as you know, in other words, expanding that wave of eth ethical concerns and moving, and my diagram, moving farther up in that, in that, on that chart. Um, and then Darwin would argue, because he thought a lot about competition, that, that our instincts are gonna compete, or are gonna lead us to compete for a place um, in that community. In other words, we want to be the best person here, but that ethics act sort of, sort of kind of counteract that self, that, that, that short-term immediate initial self-interest and, and want us or, or, or push us to cooperate. So there's a sort of tension between selfish competition and, and cooperation that's going to take us to a better place as a larger group, right? And he was having a, he was having a tough time trying to reconcile that with with, with, with how he could um, see it as, uh, as evolving and, and such. But, but that, so, so, Darwin has, it, so Darwin's Descent of Man has this, has this notion of how do we, how do we deal with, with ethics in the context of conservation. So then, our, and then our, what our modern conservation ethic, and this is what most people would probably point to, is, uh, is most clearly coined by Aldo Leopold usually articulated as the land ethic, and he's basically taking Darwin's ideas and merging it with a little bit of, of the, the emerging field of what we would now call ecology. And specifically some ideas from um, Char Charles Elton's 1927 textbook called Animal Ecology. And in that, in that um, textbook, he puts forward this idea of a, of a niche, right, or a niche. Um, and that, that, every, that if we look at a system, um, critters seem to be filling a particular role and sort of everybody has a place in the forest or everybody has a place in the wetland or, or whatever it is. Um, and so Leopold articulates it as, um, as ecology helps us expand our moral concerns. So he says ecology simply enlarges the boundaries of the community, right? In other words, we go, we're going upwards in my graph simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils and waters and plants and animals or collectively what he just called the land. And so, so that's the land, the so-called land ethic. And the golden rule of the land ethic is a thing is good or a thing is correct or a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the living world. And it's bad or it's wrong when it tends to harm those things. So that's the land ethic. And that really has, has undergirded a lot of our conservation thinking and policies, et cetera. 
And just for completeness, I'll just say that uh, Rachel Carson um, uh, has a variant of this, right? Doesn't get as much play as, as, uh, as Leopold's a famous one, but um, she also, so Carson also traces her thinking of, of why we should conserve the natural world to Darwin, but she actually goes to um, his earlier Origin of the Species um, writing, a book, um, where uh, there's a lot more focus on competition um, and struggle between things. Um, but ultimately, she talks, she's talking about the, so she wrote um, several books, right? And um, were most, what's her most famous book you guys have heard of? Silent Spring. Spring, right. So that's, so that's the one everybody knows her for, and that, that, that's her you know, most, most widely known book. But in her day and age, she, she grew up as a, um, as a scientist in a time when women couldn't really be scientists, or it was very weird to be scientists, or, un, or unusual. And, um, and she really loved the ocean. So her first three books were all about the shoreline and, and the, the ocean and stuff. And so this is, this is from that era of her writing. And so, um, and so she noted, noticed that, um, you know, as we just saw, that traditional Western ethics really focus on the sameness, right? That's, what we're, that's as we're going from the bottom, the things that are the closest to us are, are first in our circle. And, it, and it, it, we have to work to pull in things that are more distant from us. And so, so um, examples, and so, she, so some examples are, um, you know, similarity to God is what, is what gives us some of those religious-based religion -based ethics. Um, things that, that uh, use their brains, uh, and so that would be like the philosopher's uh, basis for ethics. Um, uh, things, organisms that are of our same skin and skin color and, and, and genes, and so that would be something like the civil rights based ethics. Things that can think or have sentience or, or, and or to feel pain, that would be the animal rights ethic. Um, and, uh, and then a more modern view, which is what you know, she would be talking about or someone like E.O. Wilson would be talking about, is this so-called biocentric ethic or an ethic for all life. So life in inherently uh, has value. Um, and then uh, ultimately what both she and Leopold talk about is this notion of a biotic community. So not just the parts of these things all together, but the actual, the, the wholeness of things together. So it's not, it's not just that we could put all these things in an arc. It's not that we can grab the genes from the tiger or, or somehow freeze the corn plant and save it, but that rather the corn plant in the soil with you know, experiencing rain and, and having predators and, and competitors, all that stuff together, that community itself is something worthy of our protection, et cetera. Okay. Um, yeah, this is the last quote, and then we'll, we'll be done with these big, long quotes. So just, just to, to, to wrap up this idea from, from Rachel Carson, um, she says, possibly in our intuitive perceptions, we realize the indivisibility of the earth and respect it collectively, not only as a useful servant, so not a utilitarian thing, which we'll talk about in a second, but as a living being, vastly less alive than ourselves in degrees, but vastly greater than ourselves in time and space, a being that was old when the morning stars sang together, and when the last of us had been gathered unto our fathers, we'll still be young. This, and so then she argued that this suggests one reason why we shouldn't destroy the earth with no moral concern, um, that rather the earth is an organism possessing a certain kind and degree of life, which we should intuitively respect as such, she would argue. So again, all these things are talking about going from the bottom of this diagram to the top. And we have different pathways to get there, but, but all of us are, uh, uh, the trajectory is to be more inclusive in our ethics, to bring more things into our ethical circles worthy of our concern. And what the conservation movement is going to do is first take this, this philosophy, these, these ideas, this, these philosophical underpinnings, and then start to turn those into the expected way we behave, either through techniques and or active decisions or, or, or things on the ground and or policies or laws to guide our behavior. Cool? Make sense? Any questions about that stuff so far? Okay. All right. 
So next we'll talk about a couple broad-based trends before we get into talking about specific things, but some generally broad-based trends which really, um, I would argue, uh, drive or underpin a lot of the goings-on um, in the first century of our sort of modern conservation thinking. So we'll call it 1850 to 1950. We'll call it 1850, about the founding of the state of California to about World War II uh, kind of time period. The first is um, this real concern about um, a, a stemming from scientific goings-on and technological goings-on and this notion that we are getting super powerful. We're getting very tricky and we have increasing power at, at our fingertips and that that might not always be a good thing. That that power, that, that ability to, to influence the world um, may actually turn out to harm the world upon which we depend, right? So, so, the, so technology, scientific advances, understanding may allow us to cause problems that we maybe aren't ready to, to solve. Paired with that is also this idea that, hey, if we do understand the science, if we do understand the technology and what it's doing, we're actually smart enough to say, let's not do it in that particular way, right? So let's have some agency in that, that we can choose to, to be more, what we now call something like sustainability, right? Okay, so these scientific technological concerns first. Second is this wilderness-driven worldview, a very, 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 very American thing. Um, and so we can't separate our early conservation biology approaches from this idea of wilderness. It's part of our national identity. It's baked into our national identity. Um, and it really is um, this, this contrast, put forward, nature is put forward as this contrast to um, the human world. So it's not human nature together, it's, it's humans over here, wilderness nature over there. And that, and that is very, very important to understanding the policies that will, will come. And the third big, so we have this scientific and technological concerns, we have this idea about uh, the wilderness, and then the third key thing is this importance of aesthetics, of beauty, of, of appreciating um, uh, critters or landscapes simply for the way they look. And so the, the rise of this recreate, uh, this rise of this idea that you can just go out into nature and sit there and not do anything in particular and just appreciate stuff. Um, and so uh, that reminds me of, um, saying it that way, reminds me of um, uh, on my um, first trip, second trip, when I, I think my first trip to Turkey, um, we were, um, uh, near the border of Iran and, and some places where there's a lot of people want to shoot each other and, um, and we were looking for some rare, um, rare birds, these big giant storks. And my, friends, my friend had a big giant camera, uh, telescopic camera, was taking pictures of birds and anyway, long story short, uh, I can tell you the whole story later if you want to know, but we get, we get detained by the military and we get taken to this military base and they think I'm a spy because I'm an American and all this kind of stuff. And they said, what were you doing? And we said, oh, we were out looking at birds. And basically, the army guys are like, what, well, you think we're stupid? Like, no, no, we're looking at birds. Like, nobody just looks at birds. Like, no, 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 we're looking at birds. Like, oh, yeah, right. So it was, it was, a, it was a tense time. We were trying to convince people that some humans do just like to go out and observe nature. And they, like, they weren't having it, right? They're like, what, do you think we were born yesterday? No one would ever do that. Um, but, but that idea is a very American, at least back in the day, started as a very American idea. Okay. Gesundheit. Okay. And one of the uh, ways that, that this, this wilderness idea is perhaps best codified is, in more recent times, the Wilderness Act of 1964. So this is a, this is a, a quote from that um, federal uh, law. 
So in the, in the um, preamble, in the, in the early part of the, the text of the bill, it says, oh, it reads, a wilderness in contrast with those areas where man, again, this whole sexist thing, but whatever, a, wild, a wilderness in contrast with those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. So this is very much an, a parting of us from nature, right? It's very much that we, we humans go into nature to, to get the good stuff, to get the recreation, to get the whatever. And, and that's not sort of like a natural, natural thing so much, right? Okay, and so, so th these ideas are going to be contrasted with our Western um, uh, forbear thinking, right, with, 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 our, with our Western traditions. So this, our, our, our ideas of nature and what will become important of the conservation movement contrast very significantly with the, the European views of, um, of, 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 of nature and all this kind of stuff. So the European views are very much so um, idealized nature is controlled nature. Most, most clearly represented in things like lawns and gardens. And that the controlled nature is the ideal. Um, in Europe, when people want to, you know, historically this time, when they wanted to go find God, they would go into these incredibly beautiful spaces, right? These giant cathedrals, Notre Dame, and these, these you know, places that were so high, it was like, how could people in the dark ages build these gothic cathedrals and things of that nature. They didn't find God, generally speaking, out in the forest. St. Francis of Assisi did, but he was weird, right? Most, most folks would go into these religious spaces crafted by humans to commune uh, with the ethereal or the spiritual. When we did have really <coughs> uh, <coughs> great places that we wanted to set aside, and protect. Those were not typically protected for Joe Blow. Those were protected for the king. So when we would set aside areas, they were set aside for the wealthy and the powerful. In general, there's no democracy. Not in general. Basically, there was no democracy, right? And <clears throat> there's no real sense of public ownership of of resources. It belongs to the baron, to the king, to the, to the empire, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay, so again, those are in contrast to the American stuff. So here's a, a couple of illustrations of this. So this is, um, uh, I had a, a, a PhD student who was finishing her PhD and had a, a, in the south of France, so I went over to um, do her oral defense and um, my son was young, and so my wife and son came with me, and we're going around. This is in um, a, a beautiful garden in Paris, and so it looks like this. And my son was, what was he, like three or something like that? Three, three years old, something like that. And so there's all of these, you know, beautiful gardens, and people are sitting around. And then if you look right here, there's this little teeny tiny rail, little teeny tiny rail, like, like five inches high, six inches high. And so my son, that likes nature, still does, was like, what? And he's like, look, there's grass over there. And he starts running on the lawn, right? And then immediately, a very nice guy in a suit comes running up, eh, pardon, pardon. They're like, hey, no, 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 no. Like, do not go on the grass, right? I mean, my son is like, what? My son can't figure it out. I'm like, yeah, so he had to go pick him up. He's like, yeah, go grass, won't go grass. Well, you can't go on grass. I won't go grass. And it was like torture for him, right? It was like, here's this beautiful lawn. Here's all these cool plants. And you're not supposed to touch it. Right? You're supposed to look at it. It's supposed to be aesthetically pleasing. But this notion of controlled nature, right? Don't engage with nature. Look at it. Look at, look at how well we've clipped the lawn. Look at how well we've trimmed the roses and that kind of stuff, right? So that's the classic French example. But the, we see this also in other places. Here's a classic, a so-called formal English garden. Same thing. Now, this looks more verdant, perhaps, but everything here is put there in a, for a specific reason, right? So everything's planted. Every, the hedges are trimmed. Um, again, nature is beautiful, 
but my, the, what I do to nature is what we want, right? So sort of starts off nature, but then nature reaches its best thing after we humans are, are you know, added to the mix. So that, that's, that, that's this, this notion of deep control and that, that from that control arises the value and, and the desirousness. Okay, in contrast, America was very, seen as very different, right? So America is very wild. America is just full of resources, full of stuff you can't predict. It's so big you can't really control it, right? You can't really, at least in the early days, have a lawn or, or that kind of stuff. And there's all kinds of, of wealth associated with that and all kinds of otherness. So this limitlessness, right? Of course, there's native peoples here that we had to, you know, slaughter and, and get rid of and all that kind of stuff. But, but conceptually, it's this, it's this unlimited universe type of thing. And again, this is contrasted with the, the and a lot of this stuff, right? There are native peoples there, but there's, there's, once you get rid of those folks, uh, you can kind of go wherever you want to an extent. In contrast, in Europe, right, the king, is, the king tells you what's going on, right? Or from in the UK or France or wherever, the king tells you what to do. And so um, uh, here is this wealthy guy coming to a, a, a fishmonger, right? And there's a, there's a big fish here, maybe it mixed to be maybe a salmon, right? So, okay, so look at this salmon here. And this guy says, hey, I want some of this. And this, this wealthy guy in the shop, so this guy has money. And the quote here is that, is that salmon you've got there, Poulter? 65 pounds, my lord, shall I send it home to you, your lordship? Says the, says the fishmonger guy. And the guy says, well, er, uh, look here, uh, just cut me off a half pound in the middle here and give it to me a piece of paper, right? So, so this fish which is a fantastic resource, even the wealthy guy can't afford a, 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 the whole fish, right? So this is very rare thing, very expensive thing. It wasn't for you know, the common person. And the fish runs, just like the, the, the deer populations, are the kings. And so they're, they're, they're for the wealthy, and they decide if anything is allowed to dribble down to you. OK. So all this comes together and, and in, in the US, and we start to think about things in a different way. And so I have seven different eras here, which I know sounds like a lot. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys. Uh, so all these are recorded. You guys can watch these later. But I'll also give you um, uh, a PDF of this so you guys can uh, worry about the big ideas jot down dates and stuff, but don't, you don't have to jot down every single last date, right? I'll give you, I'll give you the handout. But do take notes, because you do need to understand these things. Okay, so, the, so we're gonna go from the wilderness and abundance era to our current era of increasing skepticism and, and, and um, challenges. Okay, so we're gonna start with this pre-1854 era. And 1850, I picked 1854 because that is um, when Thoreau publishes Walden. Okay. So, oh, actually, let me ask a quick question. Has anybody here taken uh, Literature of the Environment yet? A couple people? I'm okay. Right Are you taking it right now? So, have you guys read Walden yet? No, no. Not yet. No, okay. Really okay. Okay, okay. Awesome. Okay, great. So, and you guys interrupt me if stuff doesn't make sense, right? So, don't just. I know when we start to get into dates, people just start to get in the copy down mode, but, but ask questions if something isn't making sense. It's important for you guys to understand the big ideas here in addition to the dates, but really the big ideas, you need to understand that. Okay, so first, this era is dominated by generally few people, low population densities, with generally speaking, low impact on the environment, small impact on the environment. Most folks have an extremely intimate relationship with the natural world, right? So most people, they, they understand about how cold it gets in winter. They understand how much firewood they have to bring in because otherwise they're gonna freeze and, 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 and you know, that kind of stuff. So people are in much more, um, much more in touch with the pulse of the seasons and things of that nature. 
in the U.S., um, a huge jump forward here in terms of popular understanding is, uh, is, is the Lewis and Clark Accord Discovery trip, right? And so this is a massive boon. If you guys are coming with me to Louisiana, you, we'll, we'll talk about this. But, but basically, this is um, a massive steal. Essentially, Napoleon is bankrupt or, or having a hard time fighting his pain for his wars. So he sells... He, so we, he sells the Louisiana Purchase to the U.S. and we didn't know what we bought, right? It was the best land deal in history probably. Didn't know what we bought. And so uh, these, these guys get sent out from D.C. to go document what the heck's there and, and send us back, you know, send us back samples, you know, make detailed notes, all that kind of stuff. And so it really captures the public's imagination, right? It's not exactly social media, but it was, it was the talk of the town, right, for, for a long time. And this was a multi-year expedition. Um, meeting with Native peoples, seeing organisms that the Western world hadn't really seen before, um, uh, documenting plants that we hadn't seen before, um, all that kind of stuff. In this era, the utilitarian view of nature really dominates. So, I, so there's value from nature because I can use, there's value in that tree because I can chop it down and burn it or I can chop it down and, and, and make a stool out of it, that kind of thing. In 1848, gold is discovered in Sutter's Mill. So you guys should all get that date right because the San Francisco 49ers, so people start coming in 49, right? So it's discovered the year before the 49ers. Um, and, and that leads to this massive explosion in people wanting to come to California. Um, and by 1850, um, you know, we have, we have this massive growth rate and people are running to get, get to California and um, we're seeing more and more people come to the US, more and more people come to the West Coast, et cetera. We close out this era of wilderness and abundance in terms of the, the US landscape um, with Thoreau's writings um, where he goes out to this pond and is back yard or basically nearby where he lives and and just chills right hangs out is inspired to think of God by looking at the trees and the, the mists and all that kind of great stuff and so we now know this movement is the transcendentalism or the transcendentalists movement and so they see intrinsic value in the natural world so not the value in that chopping the tree down would get us a a stool, but it in and of itself is, is cool and, and, and has worth. And so the famous quote from, from Thoreau is, in wilderness is the preservation of the world, right? So this was seen as an antidote to the big, dirty urban areas, the, 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 the dangerous places and stuff. This was a place of contemplation and renewal. Okay, so that's the first era, the, the, the pre-Thoreau era, the pre-1854. Okay, then we get into this era, about 50 years or so, 40 years of rapid resource de de depletion. And so the classic thing here, the other marker of 1854 is John O'Sullivan writes in a Colorado newspaper this, this op-ed where he coins the term manifest destiny. Can somebody remind me what manifest destiny is? Or was or is? Is it John being right to go colonize Right, so it's that it's not just that it's okay for us to go kick out the native peoples. It's not just okay for us to go convert that, that landscape to a farm. Actually, we need to, and God wants us to do this. This is our destiny. And so, so we're actually doing good by engaging in these practices, right? We 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 are we are um, agents of the light to come do this, and and the best uh, uh, 
visual of this. So, 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 so conceptually this time, dominated by the idea of manifest destiny. The best visual representation is American progress down here, which you guys have probably seen in, in previous um, uh, classes or what have you. But basically, um, you know, we could spend a whole class just on this painting. But basically, uh, we have this saintly um, uh, uh, figure going from the left, from the right side to the left side, from the east coast to the west coast bringing with her light, driving out the darkness. What's the darkness? Buffalo, native peoples, uh, uh, you know, uncertainty, right? She's stringing a telephone wire, or it's not a telephone, um, a telegraph wire, excuse me. She's bringing settlers. They're plowing under the prairie behind her. They're bringing the railroad. She, she's bringing laws, right? So all that, that, that idea, this is really this, this resource depletion era in, incarnate. So we see also in this area increasing European migration. In 1840, the US had 17 million people. By 1860, it had 32 million people, right? A massive explosion of humans into this landscape. Another key moment here is, rail, is the railroad, the ability to project power resources, military, extract resources, all that stuff. We can't underestimate the, the massive transformation that the, the rail represented. And it, it, we, we symbolically, unit, so we were building railroads from the east-west and from the west to the east, and we symbolically met up in Promontory, Utah in 1869, and that's what's this, this is a stage photo. They had to stage it several times, but this is basically a stage photo where we supposedly drive the, the golden spike, the last symbolic link to link the east and west uh, uh, rail spurs together. Also in 1869, um, uh, this also really opens up, this is really the beginning of the massive slaughter of the bison and of the, the slaughter of the Western peoples, uh, native peoples in the US and changing all of the land, most of the, their land use practices. Um, and really is the US finally beginning to project hard power across the continent. So meaning if we don't like that, we'll shoot you or we'll put up a fort and, and, and not let people do what they otherwise would do. Uh, in 1864, Yosemite becomes the first state park, and it'll become uh, the second national park in 1891. But, but Yosemite Park's established. That's going to be really important in a little bit when we talk about um, uh, John Muir and the Sierra Club and all that. 1869, we have Powell's first journey down the Colorado River. Uh, Powell was a... Uh, um, Civil War veteran that had his arm blown off. And so he was a one-armed guy and a pretty amazing dude. He, um, he uh, uh, went down, explored the Colorado, explored the Western US, the, the Arizona, New Mexico, that, that part of the country, Utah. And he, for, he was a very, it was an, I would really like to have had a beer with that guy. He was pretty cool. Yes, yes, absolutely. So he, um, he came from the Civil War, um, but, and he lost his arm, but that, he, that never slowed him down. So he, he ran the Colorado River. Has anybody gone down the Colorado in a raft? Only a portion of it. Okay, well, but you're part of it, right? Yeah. And, so that, and that's now mostly controlled with dams and stuff. This guy went down in a special raft that they built for him in a special seat, like, like a big giant high chair where he could be strapped in because he didn't have two arms that when, it, when the river started knocking to the right and left that he could, you know, he, so he had to be like tied himself in, crazy. Um, he was also the first head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and was really, really worked to sort of have um, to, within the federal system, try to have people have respect for native peoples. He argued, he said this whole idea of the, how we draw our boundaries in the West was totally stupid. He said, we, he said we should draw our boundaries based on watersheds. 
The politicians, of course, did not listen to him. Like, that's stupid. Of course, we use a river. So now we have Arizona on one side of the Colorado River and California on the other, and we fight over water. He wanted to draw things based on water allocations in the West. So it would be a more logical way to figure stuff out. So he was a crazy, he was an amazing dude. Anyway, so he goes down the Colorado and starts, starts this exploration and, and, and discussing of, of those uh, resources. 1872. Yes, there's a lot of dates. You know, need to know this one. 1872. Write it down in like five times bolded. 1872. This is the first national park in the U.S. and the first national park in the world. A massively powerful idea that is a fundamental, what we'll find over the course of the semester, is a fundamental part of conservation um, that this notion of what we now call protected areas. Yellowstone was the first. Um, and then, officially, in 1890, and that's why we close out this era in 1890, um, the, the U.S. Census Bureau says, ah, there's no more new frontier. So, so all the frontier, it's all, we're all the U.S. There's, there's no more quote-unquote frontier. We filled it all up. Okay, this era also sees the rise of soft power, of subtle convincing people of things, okay? Again, this is before television, radio, all that stuff. So this is um, uh, some of the fantastic landscape artists. This is Thomas Moran, um, but uh, doing these massively beautiful paintings. So traveling in the Western US, and painting these awesome vistas and then taking those paintings back east to the power centers and showing those off and just people saying, oh my God, this is, this is America, this is awesome, right? Um, again, if, imagine if you never saw the Grand Canyon or Yosemite or whatever and then someone brought in like a 10 foot painting of it, you'd be like, this is awesome, right? So, so the Hudson River School, named after the Hudson River Valley in New York, but really is about landscape art, generally speaking, very, very powerful, very, very important to the conservation movement. Okay, um, uh, we'll go, we'll go, let's see, let, let's do, uh, yeah, we'll do this and then we'll take a little, we'll take a little pause here, take a little break. Okay, so um, the formal foundations of our modern conservation movement, meaning the official thinking, really get going in this era, in this period. So really, really important is this guy named George Perkins Marsh, who wrote a textbook called Man and Nature, Physical Geography as Modified by Human Action. So this was for academics. This was for, this was for the learned class, right? But it has this huge, huge impact. Everybody we're going to hear about since then reads this book and, it, and is impacted by this, by this articulation of ideas. And so... This really gets people starting to think that maybe we're taking too many resources. Maybe we're over-exploiting these things. And that therefore, maybe we need to do something about that. Maybe we need to, to take some different actions so that we don't keep sucking everything dry. And this warning is taken two different, it, it, it sort of goes into two different sister paths that have been entangled and, 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 and are together ever since. So the two main branches that, that get sparked in this, in this articulation are the preservationist movement and the utilitarian movement, right? So some of this had already been going on, but this really galvanizes people's thinking. The preservationist movement, so, so, okay, so, we, so, so Marsh is like, oh my God, we're cutting down too many trees in the forest, right? And so the takeaway is we shouldn't count down as many, we shouldn't cut down as many trees. So that's the big takeaway of, of um, man and nature. Okay, but, what, but then, but how are we gonna justify that law, that policy, that, that technique? Okay. We can justify it um, a couple ways. One is the preservationist movement. Hey, 
those trees or that forest has value in and of itself. So we shouldn't just willy-nilly cut all the trees down. That would be the preservationist idea. The other, which is the utilitarian idea, is that, yeah, we shouldn't, we shouldn't willy-nilly cut down all those trees because I want to use some of those trees in a little bit. So I want to make sure that when I do go in to cut down my tree, there are trees here for me to cut down. So while they, they might both lead to us not willy-nilly cutting trees down in the forest, they're very different philosophies, right? And they lead, to very, they, they lead you down different paths in terms of what's acceptable and what's the right conservation tool that we should apply and, and, and that kind of thing. Make sense? Okay, so man and nature, um, this main idea of we're, we're, we're over-exploiting things, we're causing problems, we need to conserve these resources and we do that with a, a preservationist bent or utilitarian bent. And then we'll see, when we come back from break, we'll see how these things start to play out more and more. Cool? All right, everybody take, take a quick break.